introducing uh, Dustin Freeman. Uh, hello. Hello. Back. Is, my, is my audio functioning? It seems funny loud to me. Um, Great. So I think we are good. And yeah, I mean, you want to just take it away? I will take it away. Um, I will play videos at some point, but we don't need the audio from them at all. OK. Uh, OK, here we go. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to go deep with you on a sub feature from a long running project of mine. Uh, like many of the projects we share and talk about at this conference, this one has been in a state of tinkering for years. It has derangedly complex subsystems <laughs> motivated by playing with ideas until I find something that feels compelling. Spear of the Ages, which is what this is called, is an immersive sim where you play through history as a character that participates in their own modest way in periods of time separated by several generations. The world doesn't belong to the protagonists of any age, but they are an important passenger in it. This continues the tradition of intergenerational storytelling. Uh, this is Jojo, or this is Dio from Jojo, of course, of intergenerational stories where the actions of one generation affect subsequent ones in surprising yet meaningful ways. This is a painting from Beowulf, which I think of as a boasting plus unfinished business simulator. Um, this is an instance where someone poops in the ocean and then Poseidon, as he does, takes disproportionate revenge. A great example of intergenerational storytelling. And here is a pair of windy vampires calling out the title. I'm not the spirit of any age. That is the very spirit of your age. And so I'm going to abbreviate spirit of the ages to Soto for the rest of the talk. And let's look at a quick demo. So I'm going to press begin here. Um, this is our main character, uh, the asterisk as per usual. Uh, I'm controlling its position with the arrow keys. And then I can look around with the mouse. Um, here is a deer. Um, I'm going to move a little bit this way, see what's going on. Oh, shoot, I accidentally attacked one and <laughs> killed it, uh, as is tradition. Um, uh, let's see what else is going on in this world. OK, we have a forest god. Oh, it's feeling angry just towards this deer specifically. Um, and here's a sea god is feeling fear towards the deer. So there's certain, maybe some interesting like interactions going on. Lots of deer kind of in this area, very suspicious. Um, there's a torch in the ocean for some reason. It's probably the the... I think the ocean god picked that up and threw that down there. Um, and this is what the game looks like to start. Let's go back. So um, this talk is about a subsystem of Soda called Concerns. In Soda, I was struggling with how to make changes to the world feel meaningful, but at the same time, have the world be a genuine, decentralized, immersive sim. This gave me a creative block for actually several years, <laughs> and I set this project aside. I started this thing in 2014 and haven't actually talked about it publicly yet. So during the deep isolation of the pandemic, I came across a model used in therapy called internal family systems, a technique to view yourself as a being of several parts, each of which have their own needs. Parts, um, which is a technical term, have a complex relationship with each other, such as my desire to prove my worth by accomplishing things, being in conflict with my need to relax and take care of myself. Those are two different parts. Uh, Parts can come from yourself, but if you, if you investigate deeply, you can find parts that come from your family or your culture. These are often called legacy burdens. For example, people who are raised during the Depression may be excessively frugal and keep cash stashed away, and this behavior can be passed down to others who have no, correction or no connection to the original origin. Um, from this talk, my hope is that we can expand our idea of how we can make simulated histories feel playable. I'm going to go really deep into how I implemented concerns, but I'm also going to leave time to share some of my design problems at the end and hope to take advantage of everyone who's listening here. So find me after. Um, if you don't find me, if you can't find me after, you can find me on Twitter, email, I'll be in the roguelike chat, um, and there's my itch page, although there's not much up there. Um, let's talk about concerns and show a basic example um, of them in action. So let's see. Doo, 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 doo. Um, as is just, we will we will do things live. So let's load the demo age. Great. So this world consists of a very few number of entities. Here we have a bear and a deer. We have some gems. Um, and then here is you, but you'll just be a witness in this age. So each entity has a set of concerns. Let me turn on the debug view. So the bear is concerned with wandering. They want to collect some gems, and they care about physical safety. This deer has a fear towards snakes, homesickness, and strange moods. Um, now, there's no snakes in this world, so this concern isn't going to be ever relevant. Also, the deer's habitat is the forest, so it's never going to feel homesick. But those concerns kind of sit there dormantly. Now, on each 
uh, turn, what happens is every concern that every animal has or entity has checks to see if it's relevant. And if it is, it produces an intention. From the intentions produced, each uh, one of them is chosen randomly. And this, this chosen intention becomes the entity's active intention. And once active, this intention is totally in charge of the entity and um, it tells what action to take each turn. Uh, so let's let's actually wait and move ahead. So we have a bear has decided to go after this gem here because it's collecting gems and the deer feels a, gets a strange mood and feels angry towards the bear. Um, as you know, as happens, uh, it just it just happens. So so con concerns are defined generically, whereas intentions are really specific. So a concern like wander is a, a generic definition, but in but it produces an intention, like use a star to get to this specific grid coordinate that I chose. The random choice between intentions is weighted. So let me pop into the code here. Uh, and so here's the definition of the deer. Here's the definition of the bear. And so the bear has wandering, you know, collect gems and physical safety. So if we go to wandering, its priority is actualization, valid priority. Um, if you look at uh, collection, the priority also actualization. If we look at physical safety, that priority is safety. Now, you've I've arranged these numbers like so. If you're if you've seen a Maslow's hierarchy before, this is a very familiar, and these simply add up uh, to ha the, ha the weighted random choice um, of, of like which concern is available. So if we look at this uh, bear here, the possible concerns are bolded. There's wandering and collecting gem and physical safety. Because physical safety isn't bolded, that means that it's not relevant right now. So even though it's weighted higher in the probability choice um, phase, it's never going to come up unless Oh, the deer attacked the bear, and the bear is still you know, interested in collecting. Deer, deer's still going after this bear. Deer attacks the bear again. Deer's still going after the bear. Deer attacks the bear again. <laughs> Wandering near me. I hope the, hope the deer doesn't, I might, might, might run away a little bit. OK. This bear is alternating wandering and, OK, finally. So the, the deer, um, the bear starts feeling uh, fear towards the deer because they attacked them. So this. This concern um, became relevant, and then that sort of takes over the the bear because it has because it's more likely to be chosen, but not guaranteed. So this was a super basic example of of uh, concerns in action. Let me talk about some design philosophy. Okay. So I've worked on a lot of interactive creative systems that share agency between an algorithm and a player or facilitate interaction between groups of players. And some of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is, is, is assigned by that. So uh, I built this installation called Improv Remix, which took video snippets of theater performers and let them remix um, themselves with themselves or others. So it had a bit of you know, ability to control what's going on and a little bit of like sort of like random surprise behavior. Uh, in early uh, VR AR days, which means 2016, uh, I worked on the AI code for a simulation, simulationist creative VR app controlled by voice called Mopeboat, where you could make imperative statements about the world and the simulation would scramble to enact them. So like sheep eat bears. In this case, I think it's like pigs collect apples. Uh, and the, the simulation was sort of like dance to make these imperative statements true. And <laughs> I worked on Telepresence Live Entertainment for a while. Um, and hilariously stopped less than a year before the pandemic. So unfortunately, I wasn't there at the right time. Uh, after a few years of experiments, I was very confident that engaging with a small audience via voice or typing didn't work. So I built this Ouija board-like system where people could use their mouse to refer to, uh, whoops, it could refer to like verbs or actions or do little gestures. Uh, and this worked really well. And we used we wrote three separate live entertainment shows and barely had to modify this this standard set of communicative verbs. So from this and other things I've worked on, I've come up with these two principles that are like really important for me uh, now. First is impoverished stimuli. So <laughs> uh, we all agree that the most interesting things are always happening inside the player's head. The goal of any system a player uses is to create interesting stuff inside their head as they actively interpret it. Sometimes I think as designers, we forget this and have systems that over explain themselves or add extra art or spectacle out of the urge to, um, to you know, justify their existence, which ends up being a distraction. 
If you really want to get deeply into the philosophy of this, I highly recommend re reading this book, Jerzy Katowski's Towards a, a Poor Theater. This was written in 1968, um, where theater was trying to like figure out what was its point in the midst of uh, the upstart film. Um, uh, and the author argued that like theater is at its best when it's just a couple people in a room. It's best when you strip out all superfluous elements because that's the interaction between the people or the interaction between the entities is what's most interesting. Uh, if you look at this screenshot from the message log in Soda, uh, I'll just read it out loud. So Bear eats frog and gains HP. Frog died, killed by Bear. Bear stops being angry towards Frog. Bear starts feeling social towards you because they got a strange mood. I, if I attempted to add any kind of explicit story or explanation to this, this would take the fun away from this really impoverished set of stimulus that happened um, that generates a bunch of stuff in the player's head. Um, this other principle I want to talk about is peership with the algorithm. Actually, don't think, oh yeah. <laughs> um, so we know, we all know that it's fun to lose, especially in Dwarf Fortress or you know, any other tabletop role-playing game or even stealth games when you've been discovered. Memories of these of, of like losing can keep you uh, can keep the tension high and uh, the risk high for like an entire life from a play, even if you have one or two memories of them. But when I say peership with the algorithm, I don't just mean difficulty balance, like you know, being somewhere in a flow state. I mean that the entities don't have a particularly special status compared to you. Um, you are the protagonist only in the sense that we've called you that, and you control your own character, but that's it. So in later levels of Soda, you're born as one of the random entities in the world. You're not like sort of a god being any anymore. You're not an asterisk. Um, in this case, you're a branch. Uh, yeah. So these design principles, peership with the algorithm and improper stimuli go together to me. If the, if the player can see the bare bones systems in the game and doesn't think of themselves as different, they interpret rich inner worlds um, from what entities are doing in the world. Let's talk about world building. So there are games that start with a phase where they generate the world and all of previous history. You get to choose a few parameters at the beginning and then you wait. Uh, Dwarf Fud Fortress uh, does this well. Minecraft does it, but it's just a progress bar. Um, I fondly remember watching this happen in Sim Earth uh, and Sim Life as a kid. Um, however, these experiences are pretty passive. It's sort of like the, the opening bits in a movie um, or an opening cutscene. For the history, um, as it's been generated, the only way the player tends to interact with it is if they like stop and look at it, mostly out of curiosity, if they want to just pull in the thread of what happened here, or what's the description on this item, or what's the lore on this item. You don't really play through it. Um, it's kind of considered you know, scenery or an extra, an extra benefit. Uh, it's not really a core part of the game. Um, I'm really happy to see other talks uh, that, that where people are getting excited about playable histories. I remember Shervin and Florence's yesterday. Um, specifically, the mechanics I'm interested in are uh, small effects that become larger, which we could call like you know the butterfly effect, and reactions that persist outside their original context. Uh, a good reference um, is the, the board game Small World, which is absolutely wonderful. This is like one of the things I ended up playing that it ended up unblocking me creatively. Um, you play several eras or ages in the same, on the same map, and previous civilizations kind of come and go, uh, and then leave behind ruins and other like treats for each other. Another great example is Thousand Year um, Vampire, uh, a single person uh, notebooking RPG, which I'm not gonna say more about, you should just play. Um, so here's what I'm doing in Spirit of the Ages. So each age, the, this is the, what, the entire world map for age one, the world doubles in size, by which I mean the tiles get denser and there's uh, n squared entities each age. And so age by age four, it becomes like very complicated. Um, between each age, there is sort of this summary screen of what happened. Uh, and so the first age ends. The first to die was an eagle. Frogs were the most populous, so they shall become friendly. Deer were the least populous, so they shall become solitary. Eagle experienced the most death. Some of the gods themselves died. Desert god. So my, my goal for this is, I, I want you to be kind of in control. So maybe one third that you directly did, one third you witnessed, and a, another third are like surprises. And at each H2, I add more mechanics. This is a deranged Kanban board. Uh, <laughs> notion is wonderful. Um, but but each, each, each iteration, the game gets more complex. In each um, age, there's sort of a major narrative or overall like quest structure. But all the interesting stuff is sort of the si self-invented side quest. So, 
Uh, in the first age, there's like a, there's a dire being that like or a dire god that comes from the heavens and you know fucks up a lot of the world, but then also kind of spawns dire copies of itself. And dire is a trait that some animals will have, and that makes them violent towards others and prefer to like stay by themselves in their own homeland. Uh, and then in age two, you uplift multiple pe peoples into the world. So let me quickly demo that. Doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> okay, great. We're in age two. Let's uh, let's uplift this crocodile. You uplift the crocodile. People's name, crocodile people, kind of boring. So let's randomly roll that. Uh, dwarf, great. Likes mushroom, dislikes deer. I'm gonna give it a make blind. Oh, that's great. And then its destiny is to settle in the wetlands. Let's collect mushrooms. Oh, it likes the mushrooms. Tell them to collect it. Great. So this is likes and dislikes, and the destiny will all become concerns. So that's, we've made a dwarf. Uh, let's go uplift something else. Um, you know, I could uplift one of these sunflowers, but let's let's do, oh, this piece of sand here. So make a sand golem. Let's see, let's make, oh yeah, give it some, give it some like <laughs> anxious tension. Um, and, Let's um, drill. I'm not going to. I'm not going to define or explain that. Uh, and now there are sand golems in the world, and there's going to be uh, a bunch of them. Uh, and here's the entire world map when sand golems specifically in this area because it's their homeland. Let's go back. Um, so, what does the AI need for this you know, interactive world building system? So, first off, it needs um, concerns that can form, but then persist outside their original context. Like that's the that's the interesting part. I also want to make it easier for myself, easier for myself, and I don't want to have to exhaustively anticipate everything. Let's talk about internal family systems. Um, before we get into this, I feel like I had to make a disclaimer. Uh, I am not a therapist. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to pick and choose some therapy techniques because I want to generate compelling AI behavior. Uh, that is all. Um, IFS is a mental framing where you look at your mind as if it was composed of parts. These parts are mostly independent, but have their own feelings and needs, and can be both satisfied and discontent. These parts can also form relationships with each other. Uh, another sidebar, it's a really common reaction that this sounds a lot like schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder. This really isn't that. These parts don't have um, different full names and memories. Each part is fairly simple, like a one-off sitcom character with a basic shtick. Um, here's an example listing of parts, the sad part, the angry part, the captain, the caretaker. And that's, that's kind of it. The primary activity of uh, IFS therapy is attempting to isolate these parts and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them or facilitate conversations between the parts. Now, it sounds like a difficult leap of the imagination, but if you try it, this is actually surprisingly easy to do. Just like it's easy to imagine how you know, a friend of yours might react to something, uh, you know, even if that's in an accurate imagination, um, it's, it's fairly easy. So here's an example of a dialogue between a therapist and Marcella where uh, a therapist says like, hey, I'd like to talk to the part of you that distrusts other that distrust others and we want to understand why uh, and then Marcella kind of flips over immediately and this is fairly easy to do it's pretty easy it's pretty compelling um, and that's why I was so juiced to try it in um, in the spirit of the ages so this dialogue is a conversation with a part that is uh, what we might think of as like malfunctioning um, now most parts at any given time are not malfunctioning I don't want you to think the parts only come into existence when something bad happens as I mentioned in the beginning, I can think of myself as, a, as having a part that wants to go out into the sun, wants to prepare this talk, uh, another part that thinks I should work out or stretch more. Um, when these work harmoniously, you aren't really aware of them. Burdens are the parts that we notice. So burdens are extreme parts that appear irrationally self-destructive or you know, aggressive. Uh, Okay, I, sorry, my headset turns itself off for some reason. Um, so burdens appear irrational from the outside, but inside, internally they have a very rational reason for why they behave the way they are. I, I don't just trust people because I have lots of examples of why I don't, is what Marcella's distrusting part would say. So personal burdens are those that are developed from firsthand experience. Legacy burdens are the fun one. Um, and Here's the section from the IFS book on American legacy burdens. 
that I'll just let us sit down and look at for a second. Going back to the, you know, I feel a lot of this is like a like sort of seance like, like you're you're sitting and deeply wanting to talk to a part of your part of yourself, and with this, you know, going back to the seance metaphor, I think of these legacy burdens because they're not they're not seen directly, but they have second order effects that appear. Um, this relationship between a burden and what it does um, inspired this idea of having a concern that produces a specific intention um, as it appears in Soda. So while one part will mostly be in charge at a given time, there are they are aware of each other and develop complex interrelationships. Uh, I find this very juicy. So managers run the system proactively and strategically. Things are working because they are in charge. They move relatively slowly and cautiously. Exiles are sensitive members who experience injury and outrage. Um, Often to protect themselves or the system as a whole, managers banish them, sequestering them from experience, uh, fe uh, experiencing feelings or taking action. Firefighters react when an exile is feeling uh, bad uh, and do so without regard for the consequences, distressing themselves, managers, and sometimes even the exiles because the exiles feel it's an overreaction. Um, often what firefighters do is produce distractions such as like binging or disassociation. Parts can form alliances and deals with each other, like a manager trying to negotiate with an exile to calm it down before a firefighter... Uh, before a firefighter comes in and fucks up your whole day. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. So uh, let's, yeah, let's go, let's go to takeaways. So I wanna say, uh, I wanna say a lot of how like IFS is built is to meant to like address trauma. I'm not at all interested in this. I don't wanna make a trauma simulator. I don't wanna have to try to do that well, uh, nor do I wanna win points, uh, please applause, for claiming that I'm making an intergenerational trauma simulator. Uh, even if I did that right, I'm not sure that would be rewarding or compelling. I just want to use it as an inspiration for fun algorithms. Let's talk about Maslow's hierarchy. So every model is, is, a, is a simplification. And if you want to simulate what an AI should do, this is a pretty great ordering of you know, things that happen, have to happen in the world. Um, I mentioned before that instead of having a hierarchy or a stack like this, how a concern is chosen in the moment is based on a probability. So even if you have like strong physiological needs, you might still choose a, cha uh, choose a strange mood instead, which I'm bucketing in self-actualization, of course. Um, if you think about IFS, if, if the IFS parts as uh, needs that kind of like want attention, um, I, there's this extra detail I haven't talked about yet where I built a system so that parts have, that have had relative that have had concerns that are relevant but have not been chosen for a long time gradually increase their priority. Um, this leads to a really nice behavior that turns parts that are normally rational into exiles or firefighters. So in like really specific narrative terms, an entity who has a legacy concern to like settle into the Northern wetlands will upon seeing it for the first time, if they haven't seen the Northern wetlands before, but if they happen to run across it and they're in its wandering, um, it will ignore all physiological and safety needs until it makes it to uh, its destination. So it's sort of like a little like a cognitive landmine. Let's, oh, another, another fun part. Um, there is, uh, the other, other takeaways I have is I would like, I would like um, just like legacy burdens, I would like uh, entities to be able to transfer concerns to each other, both either in real time or both generationally. Um, and another nice detail that's possible is that any, entity can experience events that can have a positive or negative valence associated with them. If I get a pattern ahead, that's positive. If I get attacked, that's negative. But concerns can be aware of each other and other concerns can be aware of which concern was in charge when one of those like negative or positive things can happen. So they constantly be, can, can be grading and rating each other to create those uh, rich interrelationships. So let me talk about how I've actually moved into this and get into a few actual examples. So this is a this is this is an overlay view of every entity. I think this is an age two and every possible concern they have. Uh, the yellow lines are from the entity to the target of the concern in the world. Um, it's it's complex. Uh, I don't know if it's like visible to the player, but it does create amusing anecdotes so far. A uh, big principle is that there's no AI at all other than concerns. Everything I force myself to express is a concern, uh, and each entity is just a bag of them. There's no special structure or meta control between concerns. If a concern wants to, uh, to seize control, it just needs to update its probability. Um, 
so that eventually it becomes in charge, but this may generate reactions from other concerns. Um, everything an entity decides to do is expressed as a concern. There's no, again, no other AI. There's a small exception which needs to do with like, you know, healing and stuff, but it really doesn't matter. Um, so there's two, there's two parts you, of, of how concerns are, are made. They're propagated, so at birth you inherit concerns from whoever spawned you and your in-groups. Um, you also absorb concerns from nearby entities you're mutually friendly with, uh, which has led to some hilarious bugs. Uh, new concerns are formed based on context. So uh, one of the verbs in the game is patting. Um, if you receive a head pat, uh, actually non-specific body part pat, you get positive concerns towards the who, who did that, um, the biome you happen to be in, the region you happen to be in, other nearby entities, and then concern that pr prove, produced the most recent active uh, intentions. So if you were feeling homesick at the time and you got a head pat, then you're like, something's great about homesickness. Uh, I should I should lean in on that concern more. It should become more like uh, more common. Um, there's some extra details here that I think I'm kind of short on time for. So you know what, we'll we'll deal with this later. So let me let me talk about some fun anecdotes, and then I want to get to the uh, design problems. So here is a fish that randomly generated a concern where it it desires to live in the desert, but fish cannot go into the desert. However, this this fish will get increasingly frustrated. Well, to be clear, the weighted probability will gradually increase as the fish is unable to live into the desert. This might happen, we might think narratively over like hundreds of years, thousands of years. Later one day, uh, the fish may acquire a, a mech suit and then choose to dominate the desert just because it's wanted it that long. Uh, this is an instance of a bug where there is a sun god that I put in the world to that needs to speak with you. and. Um, there was a deer that was friendly near, and the deer ended up kind of imprinting on the sun god and like really, really wanted to uh, come down, <laughs> come and find me. Uh, and it started talk to me, talking to me about like stuff I needed to do, uh, but that was stuff the sun wanted me to do. Um, and here's a really juicy one. So there is a troll gem collector here. And when you collect things, you pick them up and you randomly drop them places. Now, um, this, this is the message log. Crocodiles are dire, and if they are, what that means is they kind of defend their um, their territory. If there's a non-dire entity in their territory, they kick it out. So this this troll is just picking up gems and dropping them wherever it was randomly dropping them in this territory, uh, and then of course the crocodile will keep knocking the knocking the gem out. Um, now eventually the crocodile will develop enough negative concern towards the troll, just because it happens to be nearby while this is happening, that will start attacking any trolls on site, even if they no longer collect gems which is a nice persistence of a side effect that outlives its original problem, or original cause. So quickly, <laughs> unsolved design problems. Um, how could unburdening work? So uh, a burden is something that uh, is left over that isn't as relevant anymore, so you want to uh, kind of release yourself from having to be worried about it. So let's say that an entity has a fear of the Arctic wetlands because their grandparent got attacked there by a monkey once, just once. Um, so there's a few, a few ways that could work. You could convince the entity that the Arctic mountains are safe. Or I, 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 chose, I changed the name here accidentally. So, you know, why would they believe you? Maybe it's like a weird hypnosis effect, which I feel icky about. Uh, you could convince the entity, but actually convince the concern to transfer their fear from the cause, uh, you know, to the, to the cause that actually caused it. So instead of like being afraid of the Arctic wetlands or mountains, they should be afraid of uh, monkeys. Um, so it's sort of changing the object of the fear. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that how that would play out. Uh, at the same time, if if the if the entity wants to go in there to accomplish something, maybe you can sort of like reassure that that concern, or you can upweight the priority of that concern, so it will ignore the feeling of being unsafe. Um, something that is unresolved for me is like, what if there's two concerns that are constantly upping their priority? What should what should this how should this arms race resolve? And so maybe maybe priority or kind of like we could even call it anxiety, is like an, it, it, it sort of consumes a, a finite resource. And maybe we call that moral fortitude or something. Uh, when you each, right now each entity has its own, maintains its own list of concerns. And between ages, I do a bunch of bookkeeping and I copy everything to the new entities. But let's say, let's say that like a penguin learns to fear seals or something and it's in the middle of the age. Should it then update all the other penguins? or only some of them, or maybe only the ones nearby? Should there be like a collective unconsciousness data store? Um, I don't know. 
So if there is a change like uh, a penguin's learn to fear seals, when does it become a permanent change versus sort of a short-term one? And what in-groups does it share with? So there's a few different potential in-groups. Um, I screenshot this from Shervin's talk uh, yesterday because I really like this. Um, maybe, maybe once uh, you know something comes up multiple times, it then becomes permanent. This time it could happen between ages or it could happen during, uh, and it could just be modifying all penguins, or there could be like a new subspecies that's specifically afraid of seals. Um, I'm I'm happy. I'm kind of sort of unhappy with both of these these possible ideas. Either you get to a threshold, so when 30% feel away, it sends them all over, or there's like a single instance, like a single penguin that learns to fear seals and then it affects the rest of them. Neither of those feel quite right. Um, yeah. But those are my design problems. Thanks for listening, and uh, I'm out of time. Yes. <laughs> but sorry. No, don't be sorry. That was wonderful. And we're at the end of the, the slot, so I wasn't. Uh, it was nice to give you a couple extra minutes to wrap up your thoughts because, yeah, I mean, awesome, love it. Uh, yes, and unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. But no problem. Uh, you can find me in the breakout rooms. Exactly. So Dustin will be in Rogue, and yeah, go talk about. I can't believe you gave the Sam, the power to think and anxiety, which people were very, uh... <laughs> I don't see those as different. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Justin. No problem. See ya. Yeah.